You're listening to the ADHD Support Talk Radio podcast. ADHD Support Talk is sponsored by addclasses.com. Visit www.addclasses.com to sign up for free webinars today. Well, hello and welcome back to ADHD Support Talk Radio. I'm your co-host, Lynn Idris, and I'm a productivity and ADHD coach, and I help overwhelmed professionals reduce procrastination, improve time management, and get more done with less effort so that they have more time, more energy, and even more money for what they love most. So as you guys know by now, I'm a woman with ADD myself, so I have been where so many of you guys are in that constant state of chaos and overwhelm and underperformance. And I've come out the other side, so to speak, and I know you can share the same success. You can learn more about me, what I do, and the programs and services I offer at www.coachingadvantages.com. And today I have with me Laura McNiven, and we're going to talk about living with ADHD, the highs and the lows. You know, living with ADHD is a journey. And it's, it's something that we've got to all go through, you know, as we go from sort of the discovery phase on. So, Laura, go ahead and, and tell us a little bit about you. Tell the listeners where they can learn more about you, all that good stuff. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for having me today. It's a really great opportunity to talk to you, Lynn, and to share with your audience a little bit about my story. Um, I grew up with attention issues but didn't realize it until, I guess, I started to get clues in my 20s and then into my 30s and now my late 30s, just really working through what it means to have attention issues. Almost 10 years ago, I co-founded a clinic with actually my mom, um, where we work with people with attention issues in Toronto. It's called springboardclinic.com. And we see children and we see adults, and we absolutely love what we do at the clinic. We now have 25 people on our team, really with the hope of sharing strengths-based philosophies and helping people figure out their journey with ADHD. And then this year, which was so exciting, we brought our first book. I say first book because, you know, we're making some goals. We started our um, process of sharing May We Have Your Attention, Please, which is a workbook for adults with attention issues with ADHD to work through their journey with figuring out their strengths and and in experiencing more about their challenges so that they can learn to thrive with ADHD. So thrilled to be here. And I am thrilled to have you. So do, would you like to give out a website or some other information, some other contact point where people can learn more about you? Sure, yes. Yeah. So our website is www.springboardclinic.com. So springboardclinic.com. And our workbook, which we're going to chat a little bit about today, is available on Amazon. It's called May We Have Your Attention, Please, and it's written by myself and Dr. Bailey, um, and we, it's available on Amazon. Awesome, awesome. So when you and I were talking earlier, we have, we have an awful lot in common about how we look at ADHD, and we chatted a lot about the journey. So tell us a little bit about your perspective and what you'd like to talk about for our listeners today. Absolutely. I think one of the things that's been so paramount in both my personal experience working through realizing that my brain works a little bit differently, but also in in writing the book and creating the program at our clinic has been about the huge, huge importance self-awareness brings to treatment. That when individuals are willing to dig really deep into their experience of how their brain works with the right support, that's where we see really exciting changes. And it comes down all the way to the definition of ADHD. So if we define ADHD only by the three cardinal symptoms, or two or three, depending on your experience, the big issue for me as I started to sort of work with individuals was how disempowering that was. So being told that you can't do this because you're impulsive or you can't sit still because you're inattentive, it really put things into a perspective where it's very hard to harness your strengths or figure out what will work for you. And so really focusing on the importance of understanding the brain difference when it comes to ADHD. So learning that there's really a neurotransmitter difference in your prefrontal cortex. Many of you probably, if you're <laughs> listening to Lynn and other professionals, you probably you know, understand that. And I think that that's a lot of what we want to share with this book. And also when we have opportunities to speak about it, help people understand that ADHD is not just about what you can't do, it's, or it's not about that at all. It's about figuring out how your brain works so you can leverage your strengths, minimize those challenges, and really take advantage of the neurotransmitter difference sort of when it's, when it's 
<laughs> when it's stimulated. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's what it's all about, right? It's about learning how to do things your way, understanding how you work best, why you work best that way, and how to leverage the things that are naturally strengths and talents to learn to be successful. Mm-hmm. And I, also, I often find that you have to dig into so, such minutia when you're going through that experience. So sometimes you'll be working with a client or maybe a client's working on their own and individuals working through this and you're, you're thinking about sort of the most tiny little details about something. And you think, like, why are we talking about if I have my running shoes in my bag at the door or at the, on the table or the keys hanging from here? But those little tiny steps are often where people kind of suddenly are able to make that shift and start to say, like, oh, if I, if I sort of have these structures in place, if I have this support in place, sort of things start to get easier in that in that distance between intention and action starts to close in tighter. So often it is really talking about very specific and individual things for people to make changes. That's a really, really you know, one-size-fits-all model for ADHD. I mean, I think there are the fascinating themes, but the actual answers are in you. You know, and when you're working with someone with attention issues, you're really trying to help them find the answers that they probably know themselves but just need to dig in with you to find. I love that. I often say with my clients that we're going to try to like take on an engineering perspective, right? So we're going to look at every single piece sort of at the micro level to find where the hitches are, to find where the important points are, to find really what works for you. And if you can't look at it from that analytical perspective, if you're trying to plug yourself into you know, someone else's system or someone else's way of doing things, you're not very often going to be successful. It's more of a luck thing at that point, right? Yeah, I think a lot of what we hear about when, let's say an example like trying, trying to get organized, a lot of what we hear in the general public when we talk about organization, we hear about the strategies that work for linear thinkers. So often we hear like, you know, very specific strategies that work really well for somebody who has a pretty logic-oriented, linear-style brain. So then people with attention issues or ADHD will then try to use those strategies and get really frustrated because they kind of weren't meant for them. <laughs> one, one example I have on a personal level was, so was working with the clinic director years ago at, at the clinic, and I realized that she could put lists all on one page in a row. So like <laughs> do all her to-dos on one page. For me, I have to put it in like boxes, in different Absolutely. categories, Yep. Sometimes in color, because the whole like long list is just a overwhelming. But b, I, it doesn't. My brain doesn't see it in a one list. It sees it in like a map. So kind right. of figuring out what you need to have your brain feel kind of sparked or interested or chunk chunked up in a way that that works for you. Absolutely, it's, it is really all about self awareness and all about working with what comes natural and what your natural strengths are. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And if you don't know you have ADHD, particularly for a significant part of your life, it's very hard to have done that work because you went to school and then you were kind of told this is the way that you're supposed to do it and, you know, maybe your parents said clean your room and this is how you should do it. And, you know, kind of all the messages, the general messages aren't aren't sort of those self-reflection questions. And so as you start to learn about how your brain works, stop when you can kind of go backwards before going forwards and say, okay, well, when I need to clean my room, what are the steps that I need to do that make sense for me that will help me do that? Um, I can't just do it the way everybody else does it. Do I need a timer? Do I need a fun music <laughs> playlist to listen to? What, what are the kind of, do I need a teammate? Um, what, what do I need to kind of meet my goals? And, you know, if you don't know that you have ADHD, very hard to do the work to figure that out. Absolutely. And if you go most of your life and, you know, into your adult life, knowing essentially how everybody else does it and everyone else looking successful at doing things that way, you know, it goes Mm -hmm. back to that whole, like, you know what to do, sort of superficially, you know how to do it, you know how other people do it anyway, but you still don't do it consistently yourself or you still don't do it successfully yourself, it's almost impossible not to internalize that. It's almost impossible not for, to have that impact you, you know, especially if you're, you know, an otherwise 
intelligent and capable person. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it's one of the really difficult parts, I think, of, of, you know, being an adult with ADHD, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where you really get stuck in the shame, the cycle of frustration, of upset about being upset, all these kind of, like, negative secondary emotions, low self-esteem, and then that just exacerbates the whole picture. Um, I mean, ADHD is really telling to challenging to live with and if you, depending on where you fit on the spectrum from sort of mild to severe I think you know it can be you know I'm not underestimating how huge of an impact it can have but if the secondary impacts are there the shame and the frustration the bewilderment the feeling of being confounded all of those feelings I think those are the most damaging feelings I mean I think you can get around ADHD but not when you're feeling like that Absolutely. Um, and so learning how to sort of let go of some of that pain and that hurt. You know, many of our clients sort of go backwards before going forwards. And in the book that we wrote, we sort of guide our clients to go before even trying to make a goal. There's so much work to sort of work through. Like, when did you first start to feel different from others? When was the first time you really felt disappointed? And, you know, what, what was a, who do you think you are away from your symptoms? And these kinds of questions all need to happen before you can figure out how to get to the gym after work because yeah, there's like these deep-rooted, meaningful, um, entrenched feelings that, that likely are having your brain shut down before you even can give it a chance. Yeah. I often say if you don't address the between-the-ears stuff, no amount of tips, tricks, strategies – are going to help you in the long run because you're always going to end up with, you know, whatever's going on between your ears sort of mm -hmm. being right. <laughs> you know? If you don't believe you can be successful, eventually you're, you're going to be correct. Yeah. And I, I think that there's almost a feeling of many of the individuals we work with, if they haven't been diagnosed until adulthood, they're, they're almost afraid of succeeding with a goal because it yeah. means that they're just waiting for the, for it to, to, for, to feel disappointing, like, you know, waiting for the failure piece because it's been such a long pattern of having good intentions, trying really hard, you know, all of these positive traits and then feeling like disappointed and then getting that kind of imposter feeling, that feeling of like you were kind of alluding to that, why can't I meet expectations the way others can? Yeah. So there's almost this feeling of like, it's just even hard to believe because yeah. it means that it's going to be so hard to keep that up. Absolutely. Um, those, those windows of brilliance, if you don't believe that they're sort of sustainable, you're always waiting for the other shoe to drop. Yeah, absolutely. And, and one of the things that we talk about in the, in the workbook is about your support. So we, we, we wanted to create a workbook that you could make your own. So every chapter has exercises that you can do for yourself. So you can do that, that real self-awareness work. And there's the sort of going backwards, as I was discussing, even an activity where you kind of write to yourself when you were younger, what you would say to yourself now if you could, now that you know what you know. Um, so there's this sort of work going backwards. And then there's the work really digging into yourself, sort of what are the blockers, what gets in the way of the things that you want to do, when do you feel your brain kind of goes sluggish, and in what context, so you can really dig into that. And then we really work on two areas, who, who's on your team and what does your environment look like. It's our experience that even the most self-aware, talented people with ADHD need to be aware of who their team is, who can they go to that will help them move forward, not feel badly about themselves, help sort of let them kind of get that accountability teammate going or that mm -hmm. sort of support, and then as well the environment that that even when you're really tr treated well with it for ADHD, it's my belief that you have to wake up every morning remembering <laughs> that and keeping it yeah. in focus. So yeah. you can't just say like, oh, I'm treated for ADHD, we're good. No, it's every morning what environment you have in place to help you, is that what structures are around you, what support, you know, what kind of work are you doing, to what extent do you care about that work, all these other kind of systemic um, pieces all around the individual and their self-awareness. It's, it's true. It's absolutely true. There's no cure, right? We live with our, no. our challenges are part of who we are. We can definitely learn to function better. We can definitely learn to perform better, but it doesn't go away. No. 
And I think knowing that is actually, it sounds like it's almost being negative. It's like, oh, you'll always have ADHD. It's, but it's meant to be like, yeah, that's always how your brain will work. But, there, but when you set up these things around you, this is when you can really access your strengths and your gifts. Absolutely. I mean, I know a lot of, yeah, a lot, a lot of people will sort of, there's a lot of debate around whether ADHD can be a gift, and I understand why, and I see so much pain that people go through with ADHD that, you know, it can be hard for it to feel, you know, quote unquote, like a gift. But the amazing things that I've seen, of, you know, the thousands of clients we've seen at our clinic and the amazing stories that, you know, I've heard, even especially as I've started to share my own story. I mean, there, there are special things that come maybe with just everybody, but definitely people with ADHD. When you can sort of do that work, leverage, leverage those strengths and figure out kind of what makes your brain wake up and light up, um, I mean, amazing things happen. So Absolutely. it's not negative. It's, it's really, it's actually so beautiful and wild and fun and exciting. And when you can take away the defensiveness and the shame and the anger and, and find that place where you can, you know, truly apologize if you let yourself or others down and laugh when it's funny and, and yet really sort of be able to feel that longing feeling and that, that piece of creativity and innovation that, that, that can really feel like a gift. And really tap into it, right? It absolutely. Mm-hmm. It's a, a, a big piece of it, I think, is acceptance. And that's, you know, mm-hmm. acceptance and self-awareness and, and knowing yourself. ADHD doesn't go away, but that doesn't mean that it has to hold you back. Absolutely. Totally. You can definitely learn to function well with it when you really know yourself, when you really know what your strengths are and how you work best and what your challenges are and what you need to, you know, keep an eye on for yourself. Absolutely, you can be successful. And doesn't mean you're not going to have bad days. It doesn't mean you're not going to have, you're never going to screw up again. It doesn't mean you're never going to be late or disorganized or any of that stuff. But we want those mm-hmm. things to become the exception and not the rule. And when that, when you're functioning at a point when those things become the exception and not the rule, it's not the end of the world when you screw up. It, it doesn't, you, know, you don't have to let it pull you down, you know, the way that it, it, it did when it was the rule and not the exception, if that makes any sense. Absolutely, it does. Because when you don't know why things aren't matching up, that's where the real heart comes in place, right? You're, yeah. I, I don't know why I didn't bring a present to my friend's birthday party. I don't know why I didn't show up for something that I actually care about. I don't know why. And when you're stuck in that, I must be stupid. I must be right. not a good friend. I must be you know, not a good daughter, whatever that, um, that, wherever that sort of train goes. And when you feel that way, it's really hard to get out, Um, Mm -hmm. you know, and working to figure out many people with attention issues when they aren't treated, uh, don't see the patterns. So they're kind of late regularly and the people around them say, wow, that hurts me when you're late. Right. But when you're not treated and you're not self-aware, you're kind of like, you don't really see that that's happening all the time. So kind of being willing to to step out and look at your life with a really fine fine comb, (laughs) fine tooth comb, as well as a open heart, that's when you can sort of take responsibility and and get to a place where, um, you know, you're able to, to match your intentions with your actions. And that's really what it's all about, right? It's being in alignment, like you're, your behavior and your actions and your the way you show up in the world being lined up with who you really are inside. That's when we're... That is the crux of it. Yeah. Of it all, right? Yeah. That's when we... People with ADHD and people absolutely. overall. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Getting, getting yourself, you know, kind of in sync. <laughs> your your actions and your intentions and your potential all kind of synced together. It's huge. It's really huge. Yeah. Awesome. And I think and one thing awesome. to remember is that it's right? not just people with ADHD. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's the goal for all, everyone. Absolutely. That self-actualization. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's a little harder for us to get there, but it doesn't mean it's not possible. Absolutely. But there's lots of people that don't have ADHD that aren't doing that work, that aren't doing that work as well. Um, it's almost like the ADHD diagnosis forces you. <laughs> you really, really have to do that work. Yeah. Um, but the, the, I think that it's the same goal for, for people without ADHD as well, just finding the place where your mind, body, and soul connect, and you're sort of in that place where you can be your best self. 
So I love that. That's beautiful. That's very well put, Laura. One of the things we talked about on our prep call was the staying strong piece. Speak to that a little bit for our listeners. I think that's really important. Yeah, I think I think that it's really important to, you know, stay strong through the journey and open through the journey and, you know, really work to figure out what makes you tick. And resilience is something that many people with ADHD have as a strength that they've they've fallen and they've because they haven't been able to necessarily do things the way that everybody else can in in school or in certain contexts they've kind of learned how to fall down and then get back up Um, and so there's a lot of resilience in the clients that we see and the need for us to stay strong long term and build those skills and that safety net um, is so crucial when you're dealing with something like ADHD you know you can go you know, three months with feeling really good and then kind of get hit with whether it's the blues or a dark cloud or just some frustration that's kind of dug deep. And I think, you know, it is a serious thing. And I think figuring out ways for you to kind of lift yourself back up and, and stay strong long term is, is a really important part of it. Absolutely. I, I, I agree 100%. Absolutely. It's, it's so important. Staying strong and staying hopeful and not losing sight of what's possible and what you're capable of is it's so important to get through everything from the discovery, the actual diagnosis, learning to manage all of this stuff. It, it is a roller coaster, as you said. I mean, it really can be, you can go from everything from sadness, almost all the stages of, of grief when you go through when you're finally diagnosed, when you're finally become aware as an adult of what's been going on your entire life, and all of the ups and downs in between on the journey to becoming actualized, on the journey to becoming someone whose behavior is in sync with their potential and with their intentions. So it's, you do have to stay strong and you have to stay hopeful, and it's, it's not always easy. <laughs> it's definitely yeah. not always no. easy. Absolutely. And finding the support around you, it was interesting because so we're really excited about our new workbook, um, and we, but probably the, the one concern we have about it is, you know, how will we support readers through this book? Because it's a lot, exercises and tips and stories. And I think the first message is you don't have to do the whole thing. <laughs> you might just go in and just read the character's story. So there's four um, adults that tell their story. Or you might just go in and pick a few exercises you like. Or you might, you know, work alongside a friend or, or a coach or a therapist to go through the book. But we are also building an online course because we felt like, okay, we want to give people support through this, this reading, through this sort of guide. And at first we built an eight-week course, and it's even printed on the back of the book. We said like an eight-week course. And then we started digging in deeper and thinking, and we said, well, that's way too short. This is big stuff. And so we're actually just switching it on the print versions as well to an eight-month course. Um, And that's feeling better from a facilitation standpoint that, you know, people don't need to feel rushed in this process. It is is a lot. And then once you go through the process and feel self it really self-aware and that you know what your support team looks like and your environment, well, then you kind of have to keep recalibrating. Is it weekly, monthly, yearly? I don't know. But this journey of continuously checking in with yourself, yep. hey, are my systems working? Am I you know, staying in tune with my, with my routine? Do I need to go back to some coaching? Or do I need to redo that activity with a new mindset? And so it's, it is sort of that really long-term view when looking at dealing with ADHD. Absolutely. Good stuff, Laura. Anything you'd like to leave our listeners with? Any last words, last tips, last anything before we... No, I mean, I think it's, um, it's an honor to be part of this dialogue. Um, every time I meet more people, as I talk about ADHD, you know, I'm, I'm floored by the incredible people that are part of this community. And I'm really, I feel really lucky to be, to be connecting with people on this topic and hearing people's stories. I'm really looking forward to hearing what people think of our workbook, so don't be shy. Um, If you're interested, may we have your attention, please, on Amazon. Um, And, yeah, I'm I'm really excited to hear, and I know my co-author, Dr. Bailey, as well. We're just really excited to see if it helps people, if it resonates, and looking to um, connect more with the community as we we roll this out. Awesome. And speaking of connecting, please join our, our ADHD Support Talk Radio Facebook group if you have 
questions, if you have thoughts about this episode or any episode, if you'd like to share input, anything, you know, it's a great place to connect with other people as well. Well, thanks so much, Laura. It's been a pleasure to have you. Thank all of you for listening. Once again, you're listening to ADHD Support Talk Radio with Lynn Idris and Laura McNiven, and I appreciate your attention. Thanks. Me too. Thank you. Bye, everyone.